Celebrating and taking charge of ADHD is an innovative group coaching program incorporating mindfulness as an essential tool throughout. This podcast addresses a number of topics that we face on a day-to-day basis and celebrates the precious human life we have all been given. We are already good enough the way we are. However, you may be aware of some of the symptoms associated with ADHD that hold us back. So let's take charge of it together. So welcome to Celebrating ADHD podcast. I'm joined here today with Jono Godley and Kanan Tekchandani. Hello. So, um, the topic today is about neurodiverse relationships. So I'm going to just hand over to Jono and, and Kanan to, to introduce themselves. Jono. Thank you. So my name is Jono and um, I'm 24 and I'm, I'm based in Hartford and, you know, um, I have um, ADHD myself, what ADD I should say. Um, yeah, and I'm just keen to spread the word and the awareness of it as much as possible. So that's me. Thanks for joining us today, Jono. No worries. Kanan. Hi, yeah, I'm Kanan and I am a um, actually autistic relationship whisperer and coach for neurodiverse, ni- neurodiverse uh, families and couples and neurodivergent adults. So I am autistic and I have a family of um, highly sensitive individuals as well as um, an ADHD partner. Great, welcome today. Thank you for the time and sharing. So this this topic on relationships is um, is close to my heart um, as I was diagnosed two years ago with ADHD and the reason I got the diagnosis was due to a relationship breakdown um, with my partner and my question to you to just to open it up is really there's um, I've heard this thing called the ADHD effect on relationships wondered if you could explain a little bit more about what that is. So I guess I I would like to know what you read and then I can put it into context from my experience. Okay. Well, um, what I've heard about it is it's the elephant in the room, basically, in terms of um, the ADHD symptoms, because relationships are our life and when relationships are affected then our whole life is affected so what i've heard about the um on the adhd effect is that um there's this kind of a description of a turtle and a tiger so the non-adhd partner is this turtle that kind of feels withdrawn, feels isolated, lonely, and taking on all the responsibility. And then there is this tiger, which is the ADHD partner, that is a little bit sort of gung-ho, not taking on the responsibility, and can be um, aggressive and controlling. Yeah, uh, so the, the, the energy of the individuals are different. That's how I like to see it, that when we have um, a neurotypical person with a, a, someone with ADHD or ADD, the energy is very different. So it's kind of out of sync, like you described. Um, so when they have different experiences of um, the world and the way they interact, they can misunderstand each other. They can make incorrect assumptions. And I guess that's what you mean by the elephant in the room. They might assume things which are not true, like uh, the intention behind an action. Um, So someone with ADHD might see nothing wrong with the certain way they're acting, but it doesn't feel like that to the neurotypical person because 
they're experiencing it differently. That you know, the the person with ADHD may be doing things a lot quicker, more impulsively than someone neurotypical would be used to. Cause, which means most people, most people who have the average kind of brain, mm. and then you have neurodivergence who are kind of on a sort of on the outside of that average, and so they're called neurodivergent. So a neurodiverse couple could be, for example, neurotypical with a neurodivergent, which means um, could be someone with ADHD, someone who is diagnosed autistic, um, or someone who's, for example, gifted or high potential. So it could also be someone with ADHD uh, with a partner who has autism. So it's when there's more than one type of brain type, basically. Interesting. Okie dokie. And then the um, next question is, so what are the benefits of um, a neurodiverse relationship? So, well, it's a lot more exciting, I guess. <laughs> There'll be a lot of, um, how should we describe it? It'll be interesting because there'll be different dynamics and different energies mixing. So it can lead to um, a less harmonious way of living, uh, which can be good or bad because, uh, for example, with ADHD, uh, you could say that there's more impulsiveness, um, possibly more forgetfulness. And so if you looked at that and applied it to a relationship, if someone's impulsive, um, the pitfall could be that, uh, you know, they, they might annoy their partner because they'll say, I'm going to do this with you. But when the time comes, they change their mind or they're drawn towards something else and then they let the other person down. So that's a negative way it could affect the relationship. Um, and then in terms of forgetfulness, obviously, you know, the other partner might feel insignificant, insignificant or unimportant. For example, if a partner forgets their birthday or like an um, anniversary, that kind of thing. So that's just a couple of examples. Okay, fantastic. And um, in terms of kind of the pitfalls of a neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse relationship, I know you were talking about kind of the forgetfulness side of things. Um, would you say there are any other ones that can crop up from time to time or are they the, the main ones? Uh, no, so the, the issue with, you know, neurodiversity is that we don't all fit into a nice tick box. Yeah. Every single person is unique and they'll have different traits and behaviors, different challenges, different gifts. So it is tricky to try and, uh, you know, put everyone into one stereotype. Uh, that, so there were just a couple of examples. If you want a, a couple of examples for um, autistics, um, you know, they, they need time alone. They don't necessarily get energized by being around a lot of people. It can be very overwhelming. So what happens when an autistic wants to be on their own? They don't want to be around their partner. The partner feels unwanted, for example, if they misinterpret what's going on. So that can cause, um, you know, more, more distancing and separation. Um, and also, you know, if, for example, in our family, if one of us is very high energy and wants to do things all the time and is very active and needs to burn off that energy, whereas the other person needs to be alone and have quiet time and rest, you can see there's a problem there because they're not going to necessarily want to do the same things all the time. So that can cause conflict. Course, makes a lot of sense and also I guess there's a bit of a segue question um, would you say that there's any forms of crossover between maybe conditions such as ADHD and autism because I know in the past maybe some of the um, I've noticed that some of the signs if you like of um, said conditions can kind of cross over and seem quite similar so yeah um, so um, that's totally true uh, so I'll just say that, you know, when my son was, uh, when we were not sure what was going on with our son, we thought it was, um, we thought it was ADHD. Mm. And when we got a diagnosis, it was autism. So there's definitely a lot of crossover. And the, um, the, the consultant who, the psychologist who diagnosed said, you know, the, the presenting behaviours can look very, very similar. Um, but you need to look at the 
reason for the behaviour and that's when you can tell what it is kind of thing. Um, so s similar behaviours, I would say executive dysfunction is a major one. Um, so that's when you kind of can't complete tasks maybe, mm. forgetfulness, um, you know, difficulty keeping things tidy and organised. Um, and then in, actually, in, but also, you know, I want it to sound positive. You know, we both have the ability to hyper-focus. That's it. Which is a great gift. It really it means is. You can get so many jobs done that other people cannot get done. So I guess the key is, um, you know, if someone who's neurodivergent is doing what they love, they end up hyper-focusing. But if it's something they don't like, then both of them probably won't you know, procrastinate or they'll avoid. Um, I might find it difficult to do the steps of that task that they don't particularly enjoy. Sure, sure. Now that makes complete sense. And I think that's why more often than not, it's quite important for a neurodiverse individual to um, find a career that they're very much passionate about, um, you know, whether it's creative or something like that. Um, and something that it, that consists of being able to do just one individual task and then just be able to, like you were saying, hyper-focus and stick to that task. Mm. Um, yes, yeah, so and then the, uh, the final one is um, what should kind of a, a, almost a normal individual be aware of when um, finding a partner who may have um, ADHD or autism, what could they kind of, what should they be in the know about? The I guess the extremes is the key thing. Um, so maybe with neurotypicals, I'm not so this is very generalized. You know, most neurotypicals, they probably they're kind of going along this middle path of things. Yes, they have emotions that go up and down. Mm. But with um, someone who's neurodivergent, they feel things more extremely so they may be more emotional so it can be a bit of a roller coaster kind of um, their reactions and responses may be more extreme than what a neurotypical would be used to and that can be good or bad you know like like anything um just try to think what else um i guess the thing to remember also if, if someone's just been diagnosed in that situation it's, it's a big thing, it's, um, it takes time to process because it can be a shock sure. um, and they will need their partner there to support them. It's kind of like, um, I think initially it probably feels like bad news, like, you know, a shock, bad news. Mm -hmm. And you have to go through that those stages of, of dealing with the shock and then having to process everything. Yeah. Um, and relook at yourself through a different lens. So, you know, a partner may be exposed to that that process, that journey that someone's going through, yeah. which can be quite tra not traumatic, but it's uh, very emotional. Mm -hmm. and they they will need a lot of support to get through it, and empathy and kindness is really important. Definitely, I couldn't agree more. And I suppose the the positive side of that is that these days there's a real increased amount of awareness of, you know, neurodiverse individuals and, and the conditions, uh, such as the ones we've mentioned already. Um, so that's a real plus, I think, and something, you know, every day the awareness is increasing, um, which is, is great for all of the people who are, um, you know, the neuro neurodiverse community. So I think that's it in terms of the questions, but thank you for your time. And um, yeah, look forward to speaking to you more soon. Thank you for downloading. You've been listening to the Celebrating ADHD podcast, empowering people to reach their full potential. Celebrating ADHD works best combined as a holistic treatment program, so we advise you to consult your health specialist for medical advice. If you are not sure if you have ADHD, 
please get in touch as we can recommend a medical expert as the diagnosis is all part of the journey. One of the best ways to take charge of your ADHD is through connecting with others that have ADHD too. Please follow us on the Celebrating ADHD Facebook page, Instagram and Twitter or join the members area at www.celebratingadhd.com.